he's one of the least talked about great big men of the 90s. Yet his early career resume was on par with the other great power forwards of his time. He had it all, as he could operate well in the post, but could also face up and drain a mid-range shot or occasional three. He wasn't the most athletic player, but he had great instincts and reaction time, which led to easy putbacks and blocks on defense. And while his shooting ability to his size was special, what was even more impressive was that he could handle the ball in transition or take a defender off the dribble in the half court, resulting in him finishing at the rim or finding an open teammate with his great court vision. His biggest weakness on the court was fouls, as he was never a good free throw shooter and was also prone to foul trouble on defense. But his weakness off the court is what derailed a once great career, as after becoming a perennial all-star during his Milwaukee and early Seattle years, a serious alcohol addiction took over, leading to a major drop-off which eventually saw him suspended multiple times late in his career. Vin Baker's story is unfortunate, as the early trajectory of his career had him looking like a future great. But even though it didn't pan out as hope, the career of Vin Baker is one that can't be forgotten. Let's jog your memory. A Connecticut native, in 8th grade Vin Baker was 6 feet tall and played guard, where he would hone his ball handling skills and develop great court vision and passing ability. But his high school career at Old Saybrook wouldn't be that of most future NBA All-Stars. He was cut from varsity as a sophomore, and then rode the bench as a junior. By his senior year he was 6'8", and would get some recognition, as he was voted All-State. But Baker wasn't exactly playing top competition, as he would refer to his high school competition as something straight out of Hoosiers, and the centers he would routinely match up with stood half a foot shorter than him. Baker had tried to get his name out there by going to UConn coach Jim Calhoun's summer camp, but Calhoun wasn't that impressed. Yet there was one Connecticut school who played in the North Atlantic Conference who always showed interest in Baker, and that was the University of Hartford. So Baker would commit to play for the Hawks, but they were one of the NCAA's worst teams in one of its weakest conferences. And this was a recipe for very little, if any, television exposure. Meaning for the next four years, most people learned about Vin Baker through word of mouth. A now 6'11 Baker had a minimal role as a freshman, as he would get around 13 minutes per game, while putting up about 4.5 points and 3 rebounds for a 17-11 Hawks team that missed the tournament. But Baker came back for his sophomore season as a force. He would start and lead the team in scoring, rebounding, and blocks, as he would finish top 3 in the conference in all categories. But the team went 13-16 and, and missed the tournament. As a junior, he would again lead the team in rebounds and blocks, while finishing top 3 in the conference in both categories. But it was scoring that set him apart, as he would average 27.6 points per game, which would be the second highest mark in the entire nation. But it was also the way he was doing it, as he was shooting over 33% from deep on a team high 4.6 attempts per game, which was due to three starters dealing with major injury and Baker being asked to call upon his guard skills, while still being a force inside. But Hartford was awful, finishing at 6-21. Going into his senior year, Baker was being touted the nation's best kept secret by Sports Illustrated. He was getting recognition as a potential lottery pick in the upcoming draft, but his games still weren't nationally televised, so scouts had been taking the trip to see him in person. However, someone who hadn't seen him in person was new head coach Paul Brazo, as when he interviewed for the job, he didn't even know who Baker was. But Baker continued his dominance as he would again lead the team in rebounds and blocks while finishing top 5 in the conference in both categories. He even upped his scoring, as he would finish as the 4th best scorer in the nation. And although Hartford improved to 14-14, and 14, it still wouldn't be enough for a tournament berth, as they would lose to Drexel in the conference tourney semifinals, with Baker putting up 33-12 in his final college game. He ended his career at Hartford as a 3-time first team all-conference member and the conference player of the year as a senior. So at this point, Baker was well known among league executives, yet it was still a bit of a gamble drafting him due to the level of competition he played. But being a big man with guard skills was too promising to pass up, as in the end, he would become a lottery pick in the 93 NBA draft. With the 8th pick in the 1993 NBA draft, the Milwaukee Bucks select Vin Baker from the University of Hartford. The Milwaukee Bucks were looking for direction. They were nearly a decade removed from their great teams of the mid-80s and decided to rebrand going into the 94 season, as Baker would be expected to take on a large role in year one. Milwaukee had a roster of solid players, but no one that jumped out at you, so it was an opportunity for Baker to become that player. He began the season on the bench, but after winning their first game, Milwaukee lost 10 straight. So sitting at 1-10, coach Mike Dunleavy decided to give Baker his first start 
as he had 8 points and the Bucks broke their losing streak. Baker would again come off the bench for a few more weeks before becoming a permanent starter in mid-December, as over the final 60 games of the year, he would hit double figures in 55 of them and record 26 double-doubles, and would do so while shooting over 50% from the field, as overall he would finish as the team's third leading scorer as well as top rebounder and shot blocker. He would also finish top 10 among rookies in scoring, as well as top 3 in rebounding and shot blocking, and he would earn a first team all-rookie selection. Yet he wouldn't get a spot in the inaugural Rising Stars game. But Baker would say himself on the Knuckleheads podcast that he started slow, and going into All-Star weekend, his rookie year had been a dud. Which has some truth, as he averaged just 10.6 points and 6.8 rebounds up to that point. But after the break, he would average 17.5 points and 8.7 rebounds the rest of the season. Yet the Bucks were one of the league's worst offensive teams, with an average defense, and would finish at 20-62 with Baker putting up averages of about 13.5 points, 7.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. And while no one likes to lose, the beauty of a terrible season is the chance at a high draft pick, and Milwaukee had the highest pick going into the 94 draft. So the Bucks had drafted super scorer Glenn Big Dog Robinson first overall, and just like that they had one of the highest potential young duos in the league. Robinson could score from the outside, but could still get inside and finish with ease, while Baker could operate from the block, but had the range to step out, and could even handle the ball, so it looked like the sky was the limit. Playing alongside players like Todd Day and Eric Murdoch, the Bucks' new duo would be largely responsible for the team upping their scoring about 3 points per game, as although Robinson would be their top scorer, Baker was second after improving his scoring average by over 4 points, while also leading the team in blocks and rebounds, as he would average a double-double, with his career-high 10.3 rebounds per game which would make him one of 12 players in the NBA to average at least 10 rebounds this season. His shooting dropped to about 48%, but he was also taking over 4 more shots per game, while playing a career high and league leading 41 minutes per game. And lastly, he would have his best passing season, as his 3.6 assists per game would also be a career high. He would play and start in all 82 games as he hit double figures in 74 of them, including 2 games with at least 30. He would record 49 double doubles, which included a triple-double in a March 14th win versus Charlotte, when he had 12 points, 12 rebounds, and a career-high 12 assists. And Baker's improved season saw him voted to his first career All-Star game. Yet although the Bucks' offense had improved, they still had a long way to go, finishing at 34-48 and 48 and missing the playoffs. As Baker's year saw him average about 17.5 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. The 96 Bucks made some big early season changes, as their two best players outside of their duo from last season were traded during the first month of the year, as they sent Day to Boston while Murdoch was shipped to Vancouver. But Baker and Robinson would respond with a great showing in year two of their partnership. They would combine for over 41 points per game, as Baker would lead the team in scoring for the first time in his career, behind a career high 21.1 points per game. His rebounding dropped to just below 10 per game, yet he would still lead the team in that category, as well as blocks. Baker would hit double figures in 76 games this year, including 8 games with at least 30, as well as 38 double-doubles. And he would have a couple career games over the course of the season, as in a January 5th win over Portland, he would drop a career-high 41 points on over 57% shooting. And then in a February 25th loss to Washington, he would drop 35 points on over 51% shooting, while pulling down a career-high 21 rebounds. And an improved season from Baker led to another All-Star selection. But after trading Day and Murdoch, the Bucks' scoring offense dropped to bottom 5 in the league, and late in the season, they would lose 15 straight, as overall they finished at 25-57 and 57 and again missed the playoffs. But Baker's season saw him average about 21 points, 10 rebounds, and a block per game. Another poor finish meant another high pick, and luckily for Milwaukee, the incoming draft class was stacked. So after selecting Stefan Marbury 4th overall, they would exchange his draft rights with Minnesota for the 5th overall pick who like Baker, was a player that starred for a Connecticut University, in UConn's Ray Allen. Offensively, Milwaukee had no excuses, as they had so much firepower, but it may have been a blessing and a curse, as there was only one ball. The three would combine for over 55 points, as this would be Baker's best season in Milwaukee. He was the team's second best scorer, top rebounder, and top shot blocker, while shooting over 50%. Baker would be a top 15 scorer and top 10 rebounder in the league, which led to his third straight All-Star selection and his best performance, as he would finish with 19 points and 12 rebounds. Overall, Baker would hit double figures in 76 games, including 6 games with at least 30, while also recording 45 double-doubles, as he would even be voted third-team All-NBA, 
Surprisingly, even with the addition of Allen, this would be the lowest scoring Bucks team of Baker's Milwaukee tenure. And it was probably hard for new coach Chris Ford to juggle getting each member of their three-headed monster involved. But he also didn't really have any other options, as the Bucks didn't have much scoring outside of their trio. The Bucks started strong at 5-1, and, and were even at a respectable 21-26 at the All-Star break. But they would go 12-23 the rest of the way, which included an 8-game losing streak. As yet again, Baker and the Bucks missed the playoffs. But his regular season would see him average about 21 points, 10.5 rebounds, and 1.5 blocks per game. Unfortunately, whatever Milwaukee had been trying to do just didn't look like it was going to work, which led to big change going into the 98 season. Baker was one player included in a blockbuster three-team trade, which saw him go to the Sonics and replace disgruntled forward Sean Kemp, who was sent to the Cavaliers. While Cleveland shipped point guard Terrell Brandon to Milwaukee, there wasn't a definitive answer as to why Milwaukee decided to move on from Baker, but there was speculation that after four years of losing, they didn't believe he would re-sign with the team and instead test free agency in 1999. And Baker would also say that he and Robinson were such similar players, which is probably why it didn't work out for them. They were two great players, but they occupied the same area of the court, played the same game, and were always on the floor together. So it didn't make a lot of sense. And after Milwaukee signed Robinson to a record rookie deal, it made Baker the easier of the two to move on from. But Baker wasn't upset about the trade, although it was a surprise, as it went through the same day he began hearing rumors about it. But Baker would say that he was extremely happy, as he was going to a championship situation in Seattle, as the Sonics were about 15 months removed from an NBA Finals appearance. And on top of this, a couple weeks before the trade, Michael Jordan announced Jordan Brand at a New York event, and one of the inaugural members of Team Jordan would be Vin Baker, as he was joined by his now former teammate Ray Allen, as well as Michael Finley, Derek Anderson, and Eddie Jones. Baker's first season in Seattle would be one of his best. Not only was he now playing on a complete team with a lot of capable scoring from guys like Detlef Schrempf, Percy Hawkins, and Dale Ellis, but he also had one of the league's best point guards getting him the ball, in Gary Payton. As Baker would say that the most difficult adjustment for him was the pace that the team and the West in general played at. Possession-wise, Seattle was quite similar to Milwaukee during Baker's time there, but Peyton liked to push the ball in transition, and the team as a whole played a suffocating, trapping style of defense. Baker would play and start in all 82 games for the final time in his career, yet after getting over 40 minutes per game in each of the past three seasons, he received less than 36 minutes this year. Nonetheless, he would still tie for the team lead in scoring while leading the team in rebounding, but his biggest improvement came in his efficiency, as he shot a career-high 54.2% from the field which would be a top 5 mark in the league. And about halfway through the season, the team was playing great, sitting at 36-10, and 10, but they were also a more cohesive unit, as tensions had been rising throughout last season with Sean Kemp clearly unhappy with the franchise. Yet with a much happier Vin Baker, it led to a much happier team, as Sonics players would attribute some of their success to the improved team chemistry, with Gary Payton even saying that although he had a great relationship with Kemp, the bond between him and Baker was already on a different level. Both Peyton and Baker would be voted to the All-Star game, however this would be the final All-Star appearance of Baker's career. Overall this season he would hit double figures in 77 games, including a 41 point game on 16 of 22 shooting in a February 4th win versus Indiana, as he would also record 27 double doubles. And his great season would see him voted second team All-NBA. And the Sonics were a premier team in the league, as by season's end, they had a 61-21 record and entered the playoffs as a two-seed. The first round brought an up-and-coming T-Wolves team, and Baker would have a great playoff debut, as in Game 1, he put up 25 points and 12 rebounds on nearly 58% shooting in a blowout win. But he would then average just 12.5 points and 10.5 rebounds across Games 2 and 3. He was still shooting over 55%, he just wasn't taking a lot of shots and the Sonics had fallen behind 2-1, but they would win the final two games as Baker averaged just 12 points and 8.5 rebounds on over 58% shooting. But the Sonics escaped and were moving on to a second round matchup versus LA. This series wouldn't go well, as after winning game one, Seattle would lose four straight and the series. Baker was able to put up double figures in each game of the series, which included a 20 point, 12 rebound double-double in game three, and 28 points and nine rebounds on over 63% shooting in game five. But Baker had his hands full with Shaq, as he would have at least 5 fouls in each of the last 3 games, including fouling out of Game 4. But Baker's first season in Seattle saw him average about 19 points, 8 rebounds, and a block per game. Although it was a disappointing finish, 
the Sonics were feeling good, as Baker was set to turn 27, an age when most players enter their prime, yet Baker was about to begin his downfall. The NBA lockout occurred over the summer and continued into January, and when things were sorted and players returned, Baker looked different coming into camp, as he was reportedly 25 pounds overweight, and this season would be a disaster for him. The Sonics had a new coach in Paul Westfall, but the overall core looked the same. But after playing so great last year, and the rest of the starting lineup being 30 or older, Baker had a lot of responsibility on him. Yet he was out of shape most of the year, and his scoring dropped by over 5 points per game, while he also averaged a then career low 6.2 rebounds per game. But it wasn't just physical, it was mental. Baker had never been a good free throw shooter, but this season he was terrible. He would miss 18 consecutive free throws to start the year, and it got to the point that he would be benched in crunch time. As overall for the season, he shot 45% from the free throw line, which would have been the worst mark in the league if he played enough games to qualify. But thumb and knee injuries limited him to just 34 games, as he was shut down for the final 10 games of the year. He would only hit double figures in 28 games, but would still have two games with at least 30, including a 31-point game on 15 of 19 shooting in a March 3rd win versus Sacramento. But his down rebounding year would see him record just four double-doubles. Even without Baker's usual production, the Sonics were still a top 5 scoring offense, but they were scoring nearly 6 less points than last year. However, with Baker's injuries and the added weight affecting his mobility, it contributed to their scoring defense being one of the league's worst, as they would finish the year at 25-25, and 25, which resulted in them missing the playoffs. And for the regular season, Baker averaged about 14 points, 6 rebounds, and a block per game. Baker opted to become a free agent after the season, but it was widely believed that he would re-sign with Seattle. And even after such a down year, Seattle would ink Baker to a 7-year max deal, worth about $87 million. But they probably liked what they were seeing from Baker, as he had spent the summer with the US Olympic team as they played their qualifiers for next summer's Olympics. And he was down 15 pounds after a grueling off-season training regimen. And he was looking more like the usual Vin Baker. But all the money that he had just received from his extension was one of the worst things that could happen to a soon-to-be 28-year-old who was already struggling with addiction. The 2000 Sonics had made some big changes as they no longer featured Hawkins or Shrimp, but they had acquired Brent Barry in the Hawkins trade and had signed Reuben Patterson, while also adding veterans like Vernon Maxwell and Horace Grant. And Baker looked a lot better. He would play in 79 games and finish second on the team in minutes, as although he hadn't recaptured his all-star form, he would up his numbers to finish as the team's second best scorer and rebounder. He would hit double figures in 69 games, including 4 games with at least 30 while recording 16 double-doubles, and he would have one of his best free throw seasons, as he hit over 68% of his shots from the charity stripe. After about half a season, Seattle was looking like themselves, as they were 27-13. and 13. They wouldn't be able to keep the momentum, as they would go just 20-24 and 24 in the second half of the season, but their 45-37 and 37 record was enough for a return to the playoffs versus Utah. This wouldn't be a great series for Baker, as although he would hit double figures in every game, he had just one game shooting above 45%. Seattle would drop the first two games, but fight back to even the series, before losing Game 5 by 3 points. But Baker had come on strong near the end, as he put up 18-9 and in a Game 4 win, and then had 17 points on over 53% shooting in Game 5. But his season saw him average about 16.5 points, 7.5 rebounds, and a block per game. And now over the summer, Baker would suit up for Team USA at the Sydney Olympics, as he would help the US to a gold medal finish. He would put up about 8 points and 3 rebounds per game on nearly 64% shooting, as he had just had another high in his career. But the 01 NBA season would be another disappointing low. The Sonics had acquired Knicks legend Patrick Ewing over the offseason and would get a great year out of third year forward Richard Lewis. Yet, although Baker appeared in 76 games, he didn't look good to start the year. After 17 games, he was averaging 13.3 points and 6.7 rebounds on 42.6% shooting. So head coach Nate McMillan would remove Baker from the starting lineup. As McMillan had taken over after Westfall had been fired a few days earlier, Baker would remain a bench player this season and be the team's best scorer among non-starters. But he would do so on career low averages across the board. He would hit double figures in 53 games while cracking 20 points 7 times and would only record 2 double doubles as the Sonics finished at 44-38, and 38. but this would not be enough for a playoff berth, with Baker ending the year averaging about 12 points, 5.5 rebounds, and a block per game. The 0-2 season would be more disappointment from Baker, yet more so due to injury, 
as he missed eight games early in the year with a knee issue, then missed about a month from mid-February to mid-March with dislocated toes, as overall he appeared in just 55 games this year, starting 41 of them. Baker wasn't a focal point of the offense anymore, as Rashard Lewis continued to improve, and was quickly becoming the team's second option behind Peyton. However, when Baker was on the court, he was looking better. It didn't seem like he would ever return to his all-star form, but he was a solid starter, giving the team relatively efficient production, as his 48.5% shooting from the field was his highest mark since his first season in Seattle. He would hit double figures in 37 games, including 16 games with at least 20, while recording two double-doubles. But the Sonics seemed to play better without Baker, as they were 26-29 and 29 with him in the lineup, and 19-8 and eight without him, which may have been more of a testament to how he was on defense, as he would average 3.6 personal fouls this year, marking his 8th consecutive season, averaging at least 3.4 per game. But Seattle would still finish with a 45-37 and 37 record, and a first round playoff matchup with San Antonio. Baker would come off the bench in game 1, yet put up 22 points and 7 rebounds on over 62% shooting in a loss. But Lewis was struggling with a shoulder injury that would limit him to 3 games and 2 starts, as Baker would be inserted into the starting lineup after game 1. He would play well in a game 2 win, with 15 points and 10 rebounds on over 58% shooting. But over the final 3 games, he would average 9.3 points and 2.6 rebounds, on 40% shooting, as Seattle lost the series. But Baker's regular season saw him average about 14 points, 6.5 rebounds, and a block per game. Over the summer, Baker would be included in a trade to Boston, and even though his decline had been steady the past few years, it would take another big drop once he left Seattle. The Celtics were led by their scoring duo of Paul Pierce and Antoine Walker, and they were coming off a surprising Eastern Conference Finals run, and it was hoped that Baker could revive his career and provide the team with an inside scoring presence which they lacked. Head coach Jim O'Brien would opt to bring Baker off the bench as he was getting limited minutes, yet he was shooting relatively efficiently at close to 48%. But then in late February, a headline came out which was about to bring everything to light. The Celtics had suspended Baker for what ended up being alcohol-related reasons. Head coach Jim O'Brien had reportedly smelled alcohol on Baker's breath during practice on multiple occasions in December and January. But when this didn't subside, O'Brien had no choice but to suspend Baker, as it was clear he had a serious and long-standing problem with alcohol. In later years, Baker has revealed that once he first began drinking, it was an escape for him, as he would no longer feel any social anxiety or stress that came from being a pro athlete. But his alcohol and marijuana use got out of control in Seattle, as it got to the point where he would need to have a buzz to play as he would play better, or so he thought, with him even saying that he scored his career high while he was under the influence. But it had gotten really bad during the lockout, as this was when Baker really started binge drinking. It was unfortunate that this had become his life, but it also answered a lot of questions as to why his decline had been so sudden and unexpected. And former teammate Ray Allen would later say that going to Seattle was the worst thing that could have happened to him, as he was on top of the world as one of the best young players in the NBA, while also getting a massive contract which a young Baker just wasn't prepared to handle off the court. And Baker would echo this sentiment, as he would say that success came so fast for him that he eventually lost the lust for it, and that going from being cut in high school to a perennial NBA All-Star felt like overnight success to him, which he wasn't ready to handle at that age. So Baker would not appear for the Celtics again this season, as they finished at 44-38 and, and lost to New Jersey in the second round of the playoffs, with Baker's shortened season seeing him average about 5 points, four rebounds, and half a block per game. And soon after his suspension, he had checked into a 28-day rehab facility. Then after completing that, he agreed to a follow-up program during the 04 season, which included frequent testing. And by the time teams were ramping up for the 04 season, Baker was looking like a new man, as he had slimmed down to 241 pounds, which was his playing weight during his Milwaukee days. He would begin the season playing well, as he was starting, and looking more like his old self. He would hit double figures in 21 of his first 33 games, which included 5 games with at least 20 points, and 4 double doubles. And he was also shooting over 50% from the field, as well as a career high 73.2% from the free throw line. But just as things were looking up, Baker was suspended again in early January. Baker would be suspended for a minimum of 3 games starting on January 7th for failing to comply with his alcoholism aftercare program. But then after missing 10 straight games by January 25th, he still hadn't returned. So the Celtics exercised their right in Baker's contract on February 13th that allowed them to release Baker if he didn't return within 10 games. But this also meant that Boston could void the remaining $35 million on his contract. But this led to controversy 
as Baker would say that he had done everything he needed to remain in compliance with the program and was surprised that he had yet to be cleared to return. The now free agent Baker agreed to a deal with New York about three weeks after his release, yet the league prevented the signing, but at the same time had initially approved Boston's voiding of his contract, and the voiding led to the players' union pursuing a grievance, as they felt he was due his money but also that it was unfair for the league to allow the Celtics to release him, yet at the same time not allow any other teams to pick up a player who was fully capable of playing, as the two sides would eventually reach a settlement, and Baker would officially sign with New York on March 9th. Baker joined a 29-37 Knicks team and played in 17 of the final 18 games of the year off the bench, averaging about 6.5 points and 4 rebounds. The Knicks would finish 39-43 and, and get a first-round matchup with New Jersey, who would sweep them as Baker would play sparingly in the first three games, but would have 12 points and 6 rebounds before fouling out of Game 4, and his overall regular season would see him average about 10 points, 5 rebounds, and half a block per game. Baker would begin the 05 season with New York, but spent most of his time on the bench, as he would appear in 24 games, getting about 8 minutes per game, until he was included in a February 24th trade to Houston. But in Houston, he would only appear in 3 games for a 51-31 Rockets team, who lost to Dallas in the first round of the playoffs, as Baker's overall season saw him average about 1.5 points and 1.5 rebounds per game. Houston would release Baker shortly before the 06 season, and he would remain a free agent until February 20th, when he signed with the Clippers. He would appear in just 8 games for the team, starting one of them, as the Clippers finished at 47-35 and, and lost to Phoenix in the second round of the playoffs, with Baker never seeing the floor during the postseason, and his regular season saw him average about 3.5 points, two and a half rebounds, and half a block per game. Baker would sign on with the Timberwolves going into the 07 season, but he would never appear in a regular season game, before being released on November 13th, marking the last time he was on an NBA roster. His drinking would reach a critical point by 2011, when he was drinking a gallon of cognac per day. But nowadays he is in a much better place, as after spending some time in the mid-2010s working at Starbucks, he signed on as an assistant coach with the Milwaukee Bucks in 2018, and help them to the 2021 NBA title. As time goes on, Vin Baker has become more lost in NBA history, but there was a time when he was one of the best at his position, another great power forward coming up during the golden years of the position, yet Baker was ascending at a rapid rate, and had all the tools to join the elite at the position. He could post you up or face up, he had range, ball handling, and passing vision. He was the complete package on the offensive end, but then in what seemed like the blink of an eye, he didn't look like he belonged on an NBA court anymore. He was a star in the making in Milwaukee, and looked like he was going to continue that in Seattle. But after his first year there, his drinking ramped up, and he dealt with the pressures and criticisms of being what looked like an underachieving franchise player. He was a curious case of inexplicable decline once he got to Boston. But that was when the once best kept secret had his darkest secret come out, and the magnitude of his alcohol struggles were revealed, which answered the questions around his career arc. It's unfortunate the alcoholism took a lot of his best years, and he could never get it under control until after his playing career. But the fact that he got through it is what needs to be celebrated. And when Vin Baker had a clear mind and healthy body, he was one of the most complete big men of all time. But that's it for today's episode on Vin Baker. Hope you enjoyed it, and make sure to subscribe for more videos like this one. If you liked it, check out this one on the player he teamed with during his early years in Milwaukee. Or this one, on the man he had to replace in Seattle. Thanks for watching and see you next time.